Today, it's a treat, unless he proves to be a disappointment and you can't rule it out. I mean, uh, Steve Pemberton, uh, a, a gentleman in league with a few others, uh, inside number nine, mm, is someone I've known for quite a while now. It's going to be over 20 years, heading around the same kind of things, same kind of projects, knowing the same kind of people, bumping into each other at the same kind of things. Never really worked with him other than uh, he came on uh, Would I Lie To You, brought his mum, sat in the front row and watched as he spun his tall tales. But I've wanted to have him on here for a long time, so it's Steve Pemberton. Don't forget, you can hear the full-length, longer version wherever you get your podcasts. Hello. Hey, Steve. That's a pleasing sight. Well, I'm glad you think so. I've been looking forward to this. I don't want you to feel any pressure, but I was thinking, <laughs> oh, I'm doing Steve. That'll be good. Yeah, and you've got Reese tomorrow. I have, and I've already done Mark. I mean, Jeremy must be quaking in his boots. He is. I know he is. Me and Reese always have this funny thing because we use the same um, hairdresser. Can we call it a hairdresser? Well, he's yeah. a hairdresser. And uh, whenever one of us goes in first uh, and he asks all the questions, what are you up to? And the other one's like, what am I going to talk to the hairdresser about now? You've done it. So you are the hairdresser today. And I'm getting in first. I'm really pleased. Well, look, I'm not going to say that there's a that there's a pecking order in the way these interviews have been <laughs> arranged, but it's no coincidence that I've come to Pemberton first. Absolutely, in right in the middle, the meat of the sandwich. And when I when I speak to Reese, I'll say, Reese, there is no pecking order, but there's no coincidence <laughs> that I've saved the best till last. Absolutely, yeah. Where are you? I am at home. I'm at home in my home office. You are minister for the home office and you're wearing, I think, possibly a denim shirt with with a comfy knit over yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you're very much towing the line there sartorially. You're not making any statements. You're saying, I'm, I'm a safe pair of hands. And yet, <laughs> Mr. Pemberton, I put it to you that your work has such a deep stream of affluent perversion and <laughs> and and swimming against the tide and saying the unsayable what do you say to that um absolutely well i can get it all out in in the work so you know i can i can dress you know my my nickname at um a drama school where i where i met mark was norman normal is that true Yes. Well, not, I say nickname. I mean, but two or three people called it to me because I had the most, and still do, um, appalling dress sense or very little interest in how I presented myself. But I used to wear these sort of supermarket jeans, dreadful sort of uh, cut price Asda sweatshirts. And I, I had no identity in how I presented myself and never have because I love playing the characters. I would get my jeans at Burton's and I would yeah. get, I look back, there's just a normal, what I call the open prison look, you know, the sweatshirt. And I can remember a time in my life when Next for Men was for me the height of sophistication. Mm. Yeah, agreed. I think I got my first ever suit from Next, which was a kind of sludge brown affair. Because, and this is interesting, it was the first time I think we'd been to an award ceremony. We were invited to the South Bank Show Awards and it may be the first time we ever met. Which year would that have been, Steve? Well, if I remember rightly, we we were there for the League of Gentlemen and that debuted in 1999. But it could have been for our live performance, which we'd done in Edinburgh, 96, 97. So sometime late 90s. And you were picking up, I think, a drama award for, for Marion and Jeff. And we chatted about how yeah. that had been put into the drama category and ostensibly a comedy. It Was that the first time we met? I think it might have been. I it's... think it was. Yeah, I think it was. Um, and that would have been either 2000. Or I, I think that would have been 2001. 
Well, the South Bank Show Awards, for those people unfortunate enough not to have been, you do get this very eclectic mix. So you're not just dealing with comedy people or television people. It's very refreshing. You can be sitting next to uh, an architect, an author, um, a pop star. I think the first time we went, I was sitting next to uh, the late, great Jack Rosenthal. The best awards, because as you said, you meet all those people. So that's how... I, that's why I got to know you. But you knew David, didn't you? You knew David Walliams. We'd met David and Matt in Edinburgh. So Edinburgh, we first went with the League of Gentlemen to Edinburgh in 1996. And uh, just prior to that, we'd seen a couple of... And we, we had no agent or backer or, or nothing. We'd taken ourselves up. No one knew who we were. And we'd seen a couple of preview shows, one of which was in Highgate, Jackson's Lane, uh, Matt Lucas and David Walliams. And me and Reese went to see it and we thought, wow, why are we even bothering going to to do our little sort of uh, character pieces? To hear you saying that you went to see David and Matt and you, with everything that you've done since, thought, why would we, how could we ever go and do our thing, is a lovely reminder of how uh, fragile a, a performer can be because to me that's, I mean crazy that 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 you could see anything that would make you think that when you look at your body of work well uh well, yeah i mean of course you didn't have a body of work uh, <laughs> at that point you were just um you know we were four <laughs> relatively youngish um well i say young i mean we were sort of mid to late 20s we'd been out of breton hall where where we met um for a few years auditioned for uh, children's theatre and, and not got the parts. We just had this friendship and this common sense of humour and this common goal to go and give it a, a, our best shot, really. We never thought of ourselves as uh, as part of any gang or, or part of any group. So you have no idea when you're taking a, some, a new show to Edinburgh how it's going to be received, especially if you don't have any hype, you don't have anything to put on your posters, you don't have any quotes you can use to, to bolster yourself. And we had three people in our first audience uh, in Edinburgh. And um, of course, because who's going to come and see this thing called the League of Gentlemen, which sounded like it's been lifted out of the Oxford Review or something. And, and we're all wearing bow ties and dinner suits on the poster. We, we were nervous about that. But within those four weeks, our lives changed. It sounds dramatic to say it, but everything came about because of those four weeks Edinburgh 1996. You make it sound like a rocky training montage. <laughs> was it like that? Was it like that? Was it, was it you start off, oh, you said, oh, Mark came in. He said, oh, we had three in last night. I'm not carrying on with this lack. And Reese said, it's not about you. We've got to carry on. We've got to keep on trying, haven't we? I'm doing Reese Shearsmith. And you said, come on, guys, we've got to believe in ourselves. And the next night, there were four people. Tell me about how it progressed, the word of mouth spreading around Edinburgh. Oh, you know, the, the, the high watermark for us was about show four or five, um, where we were getting to the 10, 15 mark. It, it only seated about 45 people. and um, But we'd had a review in The Scotsman. Uh, Four-star review, very good review, but it came early. And then <clears throat> we had a show and uh, Jeremy came because uh, he operated the lights and the sound. And he came into the dressing room and he said, Griff Reese jones has just walked in. Wow. And we wow. were open-mouthed. Um, we couldn't believe it. And at the end, he walked past Jeremy and he said, well done, wonderful show. And he just had this piece of A4 paper, which we gave out, which had, you know, our biographies. And he said, can I contact you via this? And he just went, yes. Of course, there was no contact details on there whatsoever. However, I did then get offered after that Edinburgh uh, a sketch in Alas Smith and Jones, which I, I, I went to film. I had one line in this sketch, but he never forgot me. And we came away with a pile of business cards from producers, um, agents, people who were interested, who, who would give their cards to Jeremy on the way out. And we could not believe uh, how this was going for us. And then you would, you would like I say, we you, you'd get the um, the brochure, the Edinburgh brochure that, that comes out, and you would look who your biggest competition was. And um, we made this game. We cut out faces of uh, Parsons and Naylor. Do you remember Parsons and Naylor? And um, yes, Johnny yes. Vegas was there. 
um, in 97. And, and we used to play this game and it was all about, who, you, you had to see who was going to win the Perrier Award. And, and we put ourselves in the mix and sometimes we would win, sometimes we wouldn't. But we got nominated in 1997 against Graham Norton, Johnny Vegas, Milton Jones, and we won. And it was the most astonishing night. And it was, I remember ringing my dad, um, who had pleaded with me really not to do drama uh, as a degree. Gosh. Because Gosh. I had, you know, I, I, I was doing languages as well at A level. And he really, we have, I come from a background where we never went to the theatre. So there was, a, you know, this whole sort of notion of being an actor was, was never part of anyone's plan apart from mine and um just that moment um where i could ring him and they used to do the the ceremony after midnight after all the comedian shows had finished to be able to ring him that midnight and just say dad we won it and he was so excited and, and proud and um yeah sadly he died in 1998 so this is the oh. year after, after we won oh. so he knew things were, were on the up and he knew we'd been commissioned by the BBC. And I've just never heard him so proud and, and so excited uh, as that. So I'm, yeah, it was, you know, we've won many other things since, but that was a, an incredibly special night, yeah. Well, Steve, two words, Billy Elliot. <laughs> you saying that you made that board game, to me, just reinforces that you four are just weighted down with creativity. I mean, you know, you could have been out shagging. No, you were making board <laughs> games about the bloody Perrier thing, right? And I mean, it's a. I say it in a flippant way, Steve, but I think it's a. It's it's a. It's a good point because look at look at you guys. You you my God, you've got so much creativity, and also all these years later, it's at the same level. You haven't. You haven't eased off at all. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, uh, we're just starting now to, to write the ninth series of Inside Number Nine. And I can tell you, <laughs> it's it's really getting hard. Well, you know how much I love Inside Number Nine. And every time I see you, I run into you at things. Maybe I'd say I see you about three or four times a year, I would say. Uh, mm. And I always do a little pitch for myself and, and I say I watch Inside Number Nine and I see many of my friends <laughs> popping up in it and I say the one thing I notice is I've yet to have the call and and I, I, do I now get to the point where I have to give you the actual story idea it's it's a middle-aged yet youthful Welsh man uh -huh. uh, dressing like a mid-period Bruce Springsteen and he's got something of Bruce about him not just Springsteen but Forsyth and he goes away for the weekend to a wellness retreat, let's say that. And while he's there, something dark and strange happens. But, but the main thing is that that middle-aged Welsh guy is in it a lot. Now, could you do something with that? Um, well, people are always very happy to give us a setting. They're very happy to give us, you know, the, the first 90 seconds of the show. Yes. Of course we could do something with that. A wellness, yeah, a wellness place. We haven't done that before. That's that's a good that is a good setting. But you need oh, twenty eight right. more pages of story. I've said before, we've we always have to be in it, me and Reese. So the characters yeah. who are you know, middle aged men we tend to just cherry pick those yeah. for ourselves. Let me tell you, listener, th this is this is what he's fobbed me off with on many occasions. It's it's very much along the lines of, oh, Rob, Rob, we would love you, but we write this part and we think, Rob, and then of course it's got to be either me or Reese. It's just, we, oh, and I hear this three or four times a you year, and, and and I shuffle back home to Claire. She'll say, did you see Steve today? Did you see Reese? Well, yes. What did they say? No, they 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 gotta play they gotta play those parts themselves. And then she says, Oh come here, love and she she envelops me and, and pats my head. Well let me ask you which of the episodes you would have liked to have been in. Where, where do you where do you watch it and go, I see myself in that role? The one with the bill in the restaurant. Yeah. I could have played Watkins's part. I yeah, I could have played his part. I could yeah. have played uh, Morrissey's he was in that. No, uh, Glenister was in that, wasn't he? Glenister, yeah. I could have played his part. I can see you more in the Watkins role. 
with, All with right, he, fine. Was, yeah. he was so good with with the little he folded up his five pound note to shove it to the bottom of, of the wallet. He was yes, brilliant. Yes, yes, off. we can all we can all fold money, we can all find little bits of business, but <laughs> we have to be in the bloody thing to start with. Okay. Okay. And I feel that I'm not being given the opportunity. I take that as a challenge, and you know, we love a challenge on inside number nine. Not that it would be a challenge to work with you. We would love that. We would love that. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yes, okay, uh, uh, I'll bear it in mind. All right, you said that you started out doing um, the, the Gentleman Live, and then it went radio. Now, you are going to be uh, at the Duke of York's Theatre. Now, who who appeared? Steve Pemberton, for two points, who appeared at the Duke of York's Theatre with the play American Buffalo in around about 1983 or 1984? Who was it? David Mamet play American Buffalo, the Duke of York's Theatre. Who was it? Steve Pemberton. Let me give you a clue as to who played in this. They played the lead role. Ready? Yes. Oh, it's a buffalo, but it's American. <laughs> Amazing. It can only be Al Pacino. I thought you were going to go for a comedy thing. You are going to say, was it Don Estelle? But you no. didn't. You went, <laughs> you went, yeah, Pacino. He played at the Duke of York. So when you, are, when, you are, when you are doing it, this new thing, you're going to have the spirit. I mean, he's still with us, thank God, at the time of recording. You're still going to have the spirit of Pacino there. Tell us about the play. Well, it's a play called The Pillar Man by Martin McDonough. Um, and oh, one he, of his he knows first, what he's doing. Uh, one of his first plays... Um, a lot of people will know him uh, latterly as, as, you know, an amazing screenwriter and, and director. Banshees of Inishurin is, is uh, going to clean up at the awards this year, three billboards in Bruges. But um, he has many, many uh, plays that he's written. This is one of his earliest. He was done at the National Theatre, I think about 20 years ago it was done at the National. But it's never been uh, revived in the West End, so it's um, it's a it's a sort of dystopian dark comedy where... Uh, a writer uh, is accused of, um, there's been some murders happening, murders of children, and the uh, these murders are echoed in, in the writer's work. So two policemen uh, are, inter detectives are interrogating this writer to see if there's any correlation between the real murders of children in real life and the murders of children in the work. And um, it's blisteringly funny. It's so, so dark uh, but he also has a lot to say about um you know the, the right to uh write what you want and say what you want and, and censorship and mm -hmm. all of that yeah. stuff which makes yeah, it yeah. very relevant to today so it's um i'm really nervous about it but looking forward to doing it who do you play i play uh, one of the detectives um whose name is topolsky and uh, the writer uh, was originally played by David Tennant in, in the first production of The National, and uh, they have now gender-swapped the role, so it's going to be taken by Lily Allen. You, you speak German, you speak French, you did the brilliant German character in, um, in The League of Gentlemen. You had such a... I mean, it's a dull old question about where do these things come from, Steve, but I do, I do want to know what, what you see as you're going about your daily life and... What do you see that makes you go, oh, I could be... I sometimes see someone in the street and I go, oh, I could, I could play him. I, I, could, I could look a bit like him, right? How much is your, is your radar on, on a daily basis? Um, <clears throat> well, like I say, I do, I do make notes of things. So we are constantly, Reese and I, going around M Muswell Hill where we write, going, could that be a number nine? And we'll pass a couple of very odd-looking people and you're not sure if they're mother, daughter, two sisters or what they are. <laughs> we, we've not done the cross-dressing thing for a long time since League of Gentlemen now, but um, and any anyone could be a, a great character. And it's usually... Usually starting from the writing point of view, I mean, you talk about the character of um, Hair Lip, which uh, we, we did in League of Gentlemen, and that was Reese's wife, Jane, was working at um, Les Mis backstage, and um, there was someone there from Duisburg, and he was quite calm, quite a calm character, and he used to bemoan the fact that he was the only queen in Duisburg, and the only queen in Duisburg. <laughs> 
And it was that combination of Queen and Duisburg, but also a camp <laughs> German. You don't associate German with, with camp. And so we, this became a little catchphrase. And the only Queen in Duisburg, this is before the only gay in the village. And um, yeah, 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 yeah. So that it was that little nugget and it sticks with you and you think, all right, that's maybe we could do a character. Maybe he's called hair lip. And maybe when I do it, I'll, I'll put a piece of sellotape across my top lip. And yeah, and have yeah. this sort of rather weird sort of gummy thing, and yeah, I you can't pinpoint where these characters come from exactly, but it was it was being playful, I suppose. I think sometimes it's just a sound, you know. That it's it's a strange thing, but I I used to do. I used to be a radio presenter in Wales in the late eighties up to about ninety one, and I used to do a character on that who was a camp German, but I find a camp German voice to be very pleasing. Aside of it being comic, I just, I like I like the sound of this sort of talking like this in a sort of gentle, sort of very sensitive way, you know. And I, he was called Conrad. His name was Conrad Bolivar, right? And I used to do him on a show and he had a song and it would go Conrad. I mean, it's all stupid stuff. I'm not claiming for a second that this is wonderful, right? But you go Conrad, Bolivar, Bolivar, Bolivar. And he had an uncle called Klaus who was very sinister. And I would play him and he would go and we'd play the Romeo and Juliet music. Du, 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 du. And he'd go, I'm looking for Conrad. Have you seen him? <laughs> and, and he would be very pantomime-like. For the League of Gentlemen, of course, we were, we were three actors playing multiple characters in the same show. So you really want to differentiate them. And you really want to push vocally. We do it a lot less on Inside Number Nine, and I've quite enjoyed doing a lot more, you know, characters that are more closer to me and, and just with my voice and not trying to push and strain to create. We've played over 100 characters, you know, over the three shows we've done. So I'm not so much pushing to do that anymore. But in The League of Gentlemen, it was so important that every character, visually and audio, they had a distinction. So, okey cokey, pig in the pokey. And we used to have this teacher at school who used to chew her, mm, Mrs. Dowding used to chew her lips. Right, mm. And then, pop, what are you talking about? And there was this thing Bernard Manning used to do and he was hot and he used to do this thing to get the sweat off his face and drag his hand down. So you draw on all these little things that you can think about. Um, and you try and make the characters extreme in a way that's what we were doing in league of gentlemen i mean when i did um a tiny part in um what's that play the taming of the shrew played the pedant and um my god i had an asthma inhaler i had my shirt tail <laughs> open through my flies i made sure my jacket was two sizes too small i had a hat i had everything ah. but a near trumpet and a butterfly net because you know as <laughs> The famous Victoria Wood sketch where they're giving notes on Hamlet. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, you're not on long. Make your mark. I don't think it's too... <laughs> Make your mark. And that's what I was used to doing. And uh, so it is <laughs> weird to find yourself doing a scene across a table with David Morrissey when he's doing his really incredibly small performance. And you're like, oh, God, you can do this? You can just talk normally. So I think I've got a bit better at that, but it's taken a long time. What I love about this job, and I don't have a plan, I don't have a, a career, five-year career map in front of me. I love the fact that you get one phone call and something, you'll find yourself doing something <laughs> extraordinary. And I, you know, last year I, I um, got a call, I did a Zoom meeting with a director and ended up going to Australia to film um, a film called Better Man, which is the life story of Robbie Williams, uh, in which I had to do a little bit of singing and dancing. And I and I was filming in Australia. I met Robbie. It's a musical. It's directed by Michael Grace, who did The Greatest Showman. You know, he's a brilliant musical wow. director. And I think it'll be a, a fantastic movie. And then you don't know where that might lead to. You have no idea. Yeah. And I love the randomness of it all. And are you playing Robbie at all stages of his life, or or just just in the Angels rock DJ? I mean, what 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 are you, what are you, which air, which, what what you know, which Robbie are you? Are, are you like because you know Austin Butler played Elvis 
right yeah. the way through. Are, are you taking that approach to it? I'm I'm the take that years. Um, right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Naked, writhing in jelly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Early stuff. Yeah. But 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 seriously, because some will believe you. Who do you play in it? Can you say? <laughs> I I probably can say I um, I'm playing his dad, and in the movie, Robbie, the character of Robbie is portrayed um, as a monkey. CGI monkey. But oh, a very what? realistic. Yes, I know. A lot of people find it hard to get their heads around that. It made sense to me. Um, he, it, you know, the people who did Planet of the Apes and that very, very realistic monkey. So it's not going to be a cartoon, Curious George kind of monkey. Um, but there's something very vulnerable about the little seven-year-old chimp, <laughs> Robbie. And he's, he is Robbie. Yeah. Everyone else is human. Yeah. He is a monkey. Yeah. And then he, he gets older. You've got that thing of being a performing monkey. You've got that yeah. thing of um, having the monkey on your back, which is depression. And he was yeah. very uh, truthful about his struggles. It's a very, very yeah. um, uh, dark film in many ways. Um, Can I ask a question? Is, yeah. is what you just said true? Or is that your dark, offbeat humour? <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, it's out Robbie there. Is, Robbie, Robbie is a monkey. Yes. Yes, called Robbie Williams. <laughs> but honestly, trust me, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. All right. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Steve, uh, thanks for doing this. Oh, the lovely, lovely, lovely. I love talking to you. Massive fan. And I always love it when we get to see each other and spend a few brief moments in each other's company. Oh, well, I've loved it too. And thank you for letting me be your ampersand of the week. <laughs> <laughs> what a delight. Say hello to your mum for me. I know she's uh, she's a big fan of mine. And um, she certainly is. Let, let's hope it's not too long before our paths cross. Middle-aged Welshman goes to wellness retreat. Something happens. Somebody gets killed. Who did it? Who didn't do it? You can have Jason Watkins in as well if you want. But let's make it happen. Okay, I'm going to plug into that AI. I'm going to feed all that in and we'll see what happens. Thanks so much, Steve. What a treat. Thanks, Rob. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. Lots of love. Bye.